From TPN at technophilespodcast.com, I'm Crystal Lee, and this is Sci-Fi Science. That is the core of why I found this book so compelling, is because the author managed to compile not just three utterly different races, but three utterly different systems of, of society. On this episode of Sci-Fi Science, we discuss James L. Cambias' book, A Darkling Sea. Grab your water-resistant marshmallows and join us around the hydrothermal vent, because this is Sci-Fi Science's third episode. Hello and welcome to Sci-Fi Science. I'm Crystal Lee Malone and I'm here again with Patrick Tomlinson and today we are discussing A Darkling Sea by James L. Cam- Cambius? Is that Cambius. right? Cambius. Cambius. Thank yes. you. This is my uh, spell check, my verbal spell check, mm-hmm. right? All right. Patrick, how are you? I'm well. I did not almost die this week. So. That's really good. Yes. Did you uh, do anything interesting this weekend? Oh, what did I do this last weekend? Weren't you in a conference? No, that's this. I'm going to be at C2E2 uh, this coming weekend in oh, Chicago. Oh, right. Although by the time all you see this, it'll already be uh, several days in the past. But yeah, I'll be down there with uh, the Angry Robot crew selling some books. So Excellent. Yeah. All right, I should send you down with some flyers. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, that would be a good idea. Good, yeah. good. Um, I also did not really have a very exciting weekend, other than almost hitting and killing a dog. But I missed it. I missed it by a couple inches. So we're all good. Uh, I saw someone throw up on a dog. Oh, gross. So, you did not need to share that. Well, it was, you know, the St. Patty's Day Parade. and Oh, right. Somebody oh, right. waiting at a bus stop. was kind of shaking a little bit. <sighs> threw up on someone else's dog. So anyway. I forgot about the parade and totally missed it. We're, all right. And we're doing that again this weekend. So, <laughs> yay. Uh, mm. Right. Because that's what happens when St. Patrick's Day is in the middle of the For week. For three weeks. Anyway, we had the shuffle two weeks ago. Then we had the parade this weekend. And then we're going to do St. Patty's Day this weekend again. So, welcome to Milwaukee. That's because the Irish are the best. Anyways, mm. let's talk about the book. Patrick, right. why don't you uh, give our readers a overview like you do so well. Okay. Um, this is A Darkling Sea uh, by James L. Cambius. It was his debut novel. It came out in 2014 by Tor Books. Um, we're getting around to it now uh, because I desperately want a sequel to this damn book. Okay. Well, we'll get into that a little bit more later. <laughs> um, but A Darkling Sea is, uh, it's its such a great mix of so many different sci-fi elements. Um, it's like the, uh, it's, it's, it's like the abyss meets, uh, meets aliens, meets first contact. I mean, it's just, there's, there's so many different layers to this book. Um, the, the main, the main event uh, of this of this novel takes place on a uh, an ice moon be- beneath the surface of the ice, uh, uh, you know, down in a, a subsurface ocean, much like you'll find um, actually scattered throughout our solar system, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, and it is the the uh, it covers the interaction of of three different sentient species. Uh, including humans uh, and an outside alien species that uh, re- relies heavily on on uh, consensus building for their for their society, uh, and then a race of intelligent lobsters that live around <laughs> uh, uh, deep sea uh, vent communities. So just there, there's there's so much actual biology and science and expo- exobiology and language and anthropology that goes into this book. It's just it's uh, it, it's amazing it fit into as few pages as it did. So that's, yeah. my, that's my intro. I would definitely say, obviously, I'm going to lean toward the anthropology there, but I was definitely had my uh, spidey senses tingling all throughout this book. Hmm. So much so that I'm literally thinking I'm going to, at some point, assign this book mm-hmm. to my anthropology students. Mm-hmm. It is. It was just wonderful. Um, I find it funny that you called the Elementarans... Uh, lobsters although i suppose that's correct well, i mean they're, they're basically crustaceans yeah um, right you know more or less i mean as maybe i'm uh and they could be crabs too i suppose but they're just the way they were described just sounds like mm-hmm. uh, sounds like something we'd put on a plate and go with butter and 
lemon. But oh, except for they're intelligent, and that would be mean. Mm. Um, well, okay. So now, since you mentioned the uh, consensus building of the Sholin, uh, mm. do you want to talk about that first? Yeah. The uh, let's start there. The Sholin are a uh, an alien species that are not from the the icy moon that this this book is set in uh they're they're like humans in that they are a spacefaring mm-hmm. intelligent high high tech race um they uh are even more high tech than humans um despite the fact they are have fewer numbers than humans and don't have as many outposts and mm-hmm. so forth uh they're considered enough of a uh an, a, enough of an equal or at least a, a military threat that there's the, the humans and the Sholin uh, maintain a, a, a peace treaty and an understanding between each other so that they don't step on each other's toes. Um, right. Actually, maybe we should point out. So at one point in their past, they were beyond where the humans are right now. Hmm. And because of their consensus idea of, of social Oh, as far as, as, far as peace, growth, yes. Right. Uh, right. They, they have just stagnated themselves. Hmm. They have at one point they were very expansionistic, which mm-hmm. um, was much like you know lots of uh, lots of colonization going on, um, and they actually pulled back and now pretty much just exist on their own home planet with uh, you know, scientific expeditions to other to other systems, but not so much the colony efforts anymore. And even the science they barely do. Right. Because mm-hmm. if you think about it, so T's... More just observational stuff. Right. Yeah. So there's a character, Tezos, and she is an expert on the Elmatarans, mm. and yet she... Knows t- practically nothing about it. Right. Them. She was. She has not been allowed to go there mm. in mm. order to study them. Yeah. She has to rely on secondhand accounts from other people. Mm. Um by which I mean to her, it would be other aliens, mm. right? Because none of the Sholin are going. Right. Um, and she, in fact, she was she studied quite a bit of the human literature because mm-hmm. that was the, that was the best, closest, uh, uh, you know, available and, and and freshest data that was out there. Right. Um, yeah. So so Ilmatar. Let's talk about that for just a second. Yeah. I want to get into that for a little bit. Uh, Ilmatar is a is a star system, uh, or actually it's a planet within the system. Yes. Um, but anyway, and Ilmatar is, is actually uh, it's a gas giant, much like what we would have here with Jupiter. And then the planet that or the planetoid moon that this takes place on is what's uh, what's colloquially known within sci-fi as a roofed world. Uh, and a roofed world simply means that there's there's ice. Uh, covering up it's an it's a water world with a with a large crust of ice and completely encompassing it there's no atmosphere because the uh it's simply not it's not either not large enough or it's too far away from its parent star for an atmosphere to to form uh or or stay gaseous um we have a bunch of these worlds right here in our own solar system um the the most famous of which would be jupiter's moon of europa uh, Europa is uh, a pretty big chunk of moon as it as they come. It's not the largest in the in the solar system. That's Ganymede, which is also a, a Jupiter moon, um, but it, it's pretty big. It's almost as large as our as our own moon, but it's almost entirely made of water. Um, it, we're fairly certain that it has a a, uh, a more metallic core, but that's several hundred kilometers mm-hmm. below the surface. Uh, and the top surface is anywhere between 10 and 50 kilometers of solid water ice. Below that, however, is a liquid, pretty briny ocean. Uh, so very much like the world that exists here. Now, also, there's, a, there's another moon called Enceladus uh, around Saturn that has uh, we've recently confirmed also has a, a subsurface ocean that, that uh, spans the entire, uh, the entire moon, uh, as opposed to just the southern pole, which was what was suspected originally uh there's also uh saturn's moon triton which is the only moon in the in the system that has an atmosphere uh, actually thicker than earth's atmosphere despite being colder uh we're also fairly certain that that has a subsurface water uh ocean or at least water lakes and reservoirs that are uh, pretty they're very very cold but they're suffused with a lot of ammonia which keeps them liquid um so there's and, and ganymede itself actually mm-hmm. is supposed is suspected to have some surface ocean uh, sub some subsurface liquid water 
uh, series in the asteroid belt is suspected to perhaps have some liquid water. So I well, I think really you could the TLDR version of this would be if you know anything about Europa, mm. that's basically what this is. That's basically what this is. Yes. And but the reason it's so important is because once we get out and we actually start exploring the rest mm-hmm. of the the rest of the universe, the chances are good that these roofed worlds, these watery ice worlds, um, will actually be the most common biosphere. Not not planets like Earth, but these icy moons that can exist uh, anywhere because they don't need a Goldilocks zone. They can be way out in the middle of. Uh, they, they can be out in the you know past the frost line. They can they can be anywhere in the system. Right. So okay. Now within this world, uh, the Illimitarans have been able to create a society because they are organized around. Um, warm water vents yeah, that are being heated yep. and mm-hmm. right and they're coming up um and so you have towns or private estates that are built around here they have developed um like piping system to mm. share and harness this vent they basically have agriculture yep. they grow various things around here um and it's very uh property based mm-hmm. I don't know if you notice that right away, but like the laws between what is okay on public property versus your own private estate are different. And so if you have it stark, it's starkly different. Yes. To the point where they're in, in, if you kill somebody on your estate, this is not against the law. However, if you kill somebody on public land, that is against the the law of the rocks, (laughs) right? It it is murder. Mm. So if you want to kill somebody, you just invite them over for tea. Um, No. And then they have some, uh, basically like guest rights um actually you know what it reminded me of it seriously reminded me of game of thrones the red wedding oh yeah because you have this idea of i have broken bread eaten salt therefore i'm your guest and under protection not that there's any red wedding in here but the Mm -hmm. idea of guest law if someone takes you under your protection Mm -hmm. um and so property is very important here uh and then if you lose it you 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 are exiled. You even lose your last names. You have last names based on an estate that mm-hmm. you that you live on. Um, now, these four, in the beginning of the book, the Ilmatarans, so these people, um, I keep saying people. Well, they are people. Yeah, but they're not the humans, right? So the yeah. Ilmatarans um, do not know about the existence of the other two alien species. Mm. All right. So they're just doing their own thing, and we, we, hear, we hear about them, and... Um, they are scientific people. They, they have scholars, um, and you, you follow around a couple of scholars. Meanwhile, they have a very clever method of, of, uh, writing too. Like they, uh, they record the way they record things mm -hmm. is, is really cleverly done because it's, uh, it being one of these roofed worlds, you know, there's, there's a couple, at least a couple of kilometers of ice above them. And then they're however many kilometers down deep in the ocean before they get to the ocean floor where these hydrothermal vents exist. Right. And so it's utterly dark. They don't have eyes. They cannot see visible light. It's not right. something that's, it's just, it's simply not a, a, a sense that they have. They have, but they have a bunch of other senses to compensate. Mm-hmm. Um, but because of that, they don't, their written language or their, the way they, they record information is on, is on uh, knots on these long reels of, mm-hmm. of twine, basically. And it was actually uh, very, very much like there was a, a system, and we've, we're still trying to decipher it, but there was a system of record keeping within uh, the Mayan Empire that used that used uh, a series of knots mm-hmm. on on these long uh, these long threads, and then they would be they would be strung into they almost looked like necklaces, and I can't remember the exact term for them right now. But um, and that's they, it's almost impossible to decipher. Um, but it was it was a very similar thing, and so instead of having books or scrolls, they had reels, uh, which is what they which is what they wrote everything down with, and then you simply pulled one of these reels through your pincers and felt the knots as they went mm-hmm. by. Yeah, actually, that was one of the things... Kind of like Morse code in a way. Right, right. And that was actually one of the things that really impressed me with this writer is that he developed this society that is not human. um, At all. At all. And did so in a way that was not... um, That was not ethnocentric to humanity. Hmm. So a lot of times... Maybe I shouldn't say a lot, but I've read other books where you have this alien species and basically you can tell that what the writer did 
is took a human and then just tried to make it exotic so it was like an alien. Mm. And that is not what this guy did. So you yeah. have this system of knots. And that impressed me right away because he didn't, it didn't seem like he started with the idea of a book and then said, how would somebody without eyes read a book? It, it looked like he had this world developed. He had this alien species developed. Well, if you have... Yeah, his his race and world building was simply was Yes, simply phenomenal. On, phenomenal. Bo- on both alien species. Yes. Um, perhaps more more so with the lobsters than with the Shaolin. But, yeah. Uh, but the Shaolin were also... would In any other book... The Shaolin would have been one of the more imp- one of the most impressive standalone, uh, mm-hmm. you know, alien cultures I'd have come across. But with the presence of right. the Tarans, it's like okay, I just totally threw it out. <laughs> right, but let's um, so let's let's talk about the Shaolin for a minute um, because not that I want to ignore the humans, but mm. it's pretty. We they're, all know they're, what humans are. Yeah, they're yeah. they're set up like humans, so that's fine. Mm. So you have the Ilmataran, and they have this property based, um, almost serfdom like society where you're like and have apprentices they and whatnot the children i thought was really interesting too because that was because the and they didn't i mean they're they're lobsters okay so they they come up with you know they they, they don't give live birth they lay tons and tons and tens of thousands of eggs mm-hmm. and then just kind of throw them out into the into the currents and any of the and kids any of those kids that that make it past the first couple three years or whatever grow to a certain size no one's raising them they're just out there feeding until they get to a certain size yeah they're feral they're completely feral uh and then adults just go out and grab them mm-hmm. grab the strongest ones pick the ones that they, they that show the most i don't know most moxie promise. or promise yeah. uh and then raise them like there's there's no actual genetic connection there's there, there's no direct genetic connection between the the adults that are raising the kids mm-hmm. and and the the kids themselves, which you know it's like, which is exactly how it would have to work in a society like right. that. Right. Right. So, but I actually also wondered about how it worked with the the Sholin and their kids because now the Sholin they have this consensus thing that we mentioned, which basically you could say. Um, Oh, we they, they want everyone to have a consensus and then the decision has been made. We forgot right? to mention the Sholin are basically uh, six-legged giant otters, more or less. Uh, yeah, I guess you could say otter. I kept thinking of like a otter centaur type sure. thing. I don't Close know. Close enough. But... They, yeah, they're weird. Um, no, but okay, so you have the consensus, but even weirder than that, because we've had the idea of like small societies with consensus on, the, on our planet is... Um, instead of a human-like hierarchy, they have their hierarchy is basically based on sex. Mm. So, and that's why I was kind of wondering about the children, because at one point, like Tiso's mentions her parents, and I, I'm ser- like, I seriously wondered at that point. How could does she, she even know? Right? How could she know who her father is? Right, because these, they're they're boning constantly, all it's, the time, and, yeah, and it's, they, just, it's part of a. It's, Sex becomes part of uh, of each uh, of all of their uh, interpersonal relationships. Yeah, you know, right. Whether it be even between the places that humans would find it completely inappropriate, yes. like a superior and a, uh, you know, and someone lower in the chain of command. Uh, right, but between we should, friends and all that. Right, but we should clarify: it's not that sex is just accepted, and so it happens all the time. It is the proper relationship between a leader and their and their subordinates is sexual. Mm. Like they should be having sex because that is how they bond and then reach consensus, mm-hmm. um, which makes sense because even you can agree on a lot of things right <laughs> after having sex. Well, and that's true, but they don't rely just on sex. They have they essentially are drugging themselves all the time. Mm-hmm. If you look at their food processors, they talk about um, you know if they're going to have a certain type of meeting, how they put certain pheromones and stimulants or relaxants into the food that they're eating mm-hmm. in order to prepare for these meetings. In order to make it easier for everyone to reach right consensus. to reach consensus. So they're basically roofing each other before they go into business meetings. It's yes, pretty, yes, that is exactly what they're doing. And their society works like it's right. kind of nuts, but. Um, but it's just a different way to. That's that's why that's that is the core of why I found this book so compelling is because they they can the the author managed to compile three utterly different, not just uh, three utterly different races, but three utterly different systems of of society, mm-hmm. and they all worked and they all worked 
they all had rough edges and they all sure. made you, and like and they were all the especially the two non-human ones were weird enough you're like how the hell <laughs> But but they but it worked and yeah. uh, and it was done in a in a convincing way and it was done in a convincing way to even show the limitations of the societies. Right. Well, the Sholin it really stands out because they at some point uh, before the story starts they came to a consensus that they were no longer going to be colonizers. They were going to basically go back to a small scale society, and, and this more, was a conscious decision. More agrarian, and they right. were going to limit their numbers. Right. And... So, so they have they have done this, but you see the limitations of that in this book because now that they have made contacts with humans, they actually start building a few spaceships now because they feel like, well, we should be prepared. Prepared for what is questionable. It depends on which Sholin you ask. You can see disagreement despite their consensus between, especially Tezos and Irona. Mm. Um, Irona is um, Irona was interesting because he's kind of this militaristic personality, but then combined with this obsession, which the best way I could describe it is the Star Trek Prime Directive mm-hmm. of do not contaminate other people, keep to yourselves, let them evolve on their own. Right. And so he is extremely unhappy with the fact that the humans are on Ilmatar and studying the Ilmatarans, even though they're not getting that close, there was all these agreements of how they won't go into the settlements, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, but they, Irona and his faction are so terrified of this idea of contamination that it gets to the point where they go um, like in the opposite direction from the rest of the Sholin with peaceful agrarian small scale right. society. Yeah. Well, and the the trouble with the sh- with the Sholin society was that uh, as long it was as long as as long as it was just them, mm-hmm. it wouldn't have been any problem, right? Because they were they were able en- enough to make a consensus among themselves uh, and stick to it. Mm-hmm. But then the humans turned up and right were. The humans in this book work more off of consensus than perhaps some groups of humans do here on the planet Earth right now. But mm-hmm. there's still, you know, they, they still have disagreements and they're still driven uh, by by a mixture of both, uh, you know, collaboration as well as conflict. Mm-hmm. And they're not interested in just staying on the home world. Right. So as soon as you run into that, uh, that just throws a huge monkey wrench in the whole thing. And now the Sholin are looking at, uh, okay, well... The humans aren't going to stop expanding. Right. We're not going to reach consensus with the humans. Right. We've already come to a consensus amongst ourselves. So either we stick with what we've already decided on or we throw that out entirely to try and keep pace with the human expansion. Mm-hmm. And there's huge disagreements on how with internally, politically, with how to uh, with how to deal with that. Well, right. And it's ironic that with... Um... And again, this is a technologically advanced civilization whose tech level is even f- more advanced than humans at this point. Yes, although they're still going back into their history in order to build the things that they need right, now to do Right, because they've just the kind humans. of been sitting there for right, however right. many centuries. And yeah. that adds to the fear because part of the fear that you see in Irona, who is basically like the personification of that faction of Sholin, is that... Um, even though they're more technologically advanced, there's something to be feared from the humans because they've been practicing warfare this whole time, whereas we have not. Right. And we have forgotten all of this. Now we have to go back to the history books and, and read. And there's a big difference between reading about war or reading about anything, really, and then practicing it, whether right. it's well, war that, or not. And that comes out in the book, too, because mm-hmm. uh, there's uh, at one point the, the Sholin uh, decide that the, the human uh, expedition to Ilmatar must end. Uh, and they just go to the humans and say, hey, we've decided that you can't be here anymore, so if you could all just get together and leave, that'd be great. And the humans are like, well, we're not going to do that. And then and the showmen are like, well, wh- what do you mean you're not going to do that? And it's like, well, we're, we're not going to do that, so make us. Right, well, in this... What do you mean make us? And, then, <laughs> and, they just, and it just gets completely out of control because they've never had to deal with somebody being, being insolent before. Right. They've never had to deal with someone who just doesn't agree. Right, right. And actually, this this is part of the um, ongoing theme throughout this book of cross-cultural contact. Mm-hmm. This is why I want to assign this book to anthropology students. Um, so this is 
an example of the shul and don't know how to react to that mm. because for it's, centuries it's outside is, of their it's completely outside of their their experience. realm of reality yeah, right it exactly it's not something they were prepared for um and ironically irona despite his we got to protect the Ilmatarans, which is very patronizing because mm. the Ilmatarans are not dumb they have, I mean, they might not know a whole lot outside of their own world, but we're not talking about a dumb species of people. No, like no, I mean, educated. Their, their level of intellect is probably, I mean, the way it was presented in the book, their level of intellect was was probably at least on par with the humans, uh, you know, or and the and the Shaolin without right. Any to, they're, they're they're technologically behind. I mean, they're basically trapped in the Stone Age because. Well, they live underwater. Right. There's right. N- you can't start a fire and smelt metals right. when you live several kilometers right. underneath the surface of the ocean. It doesn't. So your the, the the range of technology that will ever be available to you is right pretty severely limited. But the irony here is that Arona is trying to protect this one intelligent species and have this whole prime directive. Let's not get involved. And he is willing to completely, you know, go against that with the humans. And he talks about. Um, forcing the humans to stay on Earth or in their own solar system, not allowing them to expand, um, basically forcing the humans to live the way the Sholin live. Right. Yeah. So despite having this idea of let these people over here evolve the way they want to, but these people over here, no, we don't like them, so we're not going to allow them to, to the, evolve the way to the want point to. that he was willing to destroy an entire Elmataran village. Yes. In order to contain the contamination. We are at earmuffs yeah. point. Okay, no, you're right. We're, 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 this is going to be a spoiler laden episode no matter what we do. I know, but, it's impossible. Um, it is so wonderful though. But we are definitely, as soon as you said that, I'm like, this is okay, definitely yeah. earmuffs. Anyway, so, um, but yes, there was, uh, there, there, there comes a point later in the book where like he is so fixated on this, mm-hmm. on this notion of, of, uh, you know, of the human's influence being evil. And, and and wrong morally just just because it is mm-hmm. that he's willing to sacrifice the lives of however many hundreds of, of Ilmatarans right. uh, just to keep them from you know just to keep that from spreading out and so it's like he's like and that's that's when he cro- completely crosses the line into it's like okay now you're not even you, you've gone past you know non uh, non interference into right. this whole you know active denial situation. Right. And going so a part of that, but going back a little bit to the cross cultural little contact um, problems. So the humans, in addition, in the beginning, it starts with them just saying, "No, we're not going to leave." Mm-hmm. And then because of the shul and keep ins- insisting, um, the humans start discussing ways of protesting and ways of peaceful resistance. Mm-hmm. And in the humans' understanding, that is what they're doing. So you have an example where some humans who the Sholin wants to remove, tie themselves to their hammocks, right? Mm. These are things that you saw in the 60s. Sure, Um, yeah. And and there's other things, like they would do... Sabotage of things here and there. Yeah, and and, and chanting. Mm. And the chanting was interesting because the humans are, you know, doing these small chants and the Sholin interpret it as, like, the Sholin actually talk to each other and they go, I don't understand. They started shrieking, but they weren't in pain. I don't understand what was happening. Mm. And what it was was chanting, right? Mm. So they don't understand and this eventually does escalate to violence and Mm. the violence is large part because of the misunderstanding now i'm not saying if they understood it wouldn't have gotten to violence because Mm. the character of arona was looking for a fight it's pretty obvious i mean he brought torpedoes he brings (laughs) guns you know he brought soldiers down. he brought soldiers i mean he was looking for a fight but the fact that there was so much misunderstanding really took out the possibility of talking through this Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, now in that part, you have this very violent eruption. But then even with the Ilamatarans, I think um, Cambias did an excellent job of portraying what it is like to talk to somebody or try to talk to somebody when you don't have a dictionary, when you don't have an expert there who can interpret oh, things yeah, for you. Have, you. And no, there's there's no Rosetta Stone there. Like yes. they're started, they're bo- both sides are starting from absolute scratch, and they're trying to do it in ways that like they, because the the ways that that humans would communicate are completely unavailable to Elementarians because right. they can't read because they well I mean they read but they read they read their reels they don't right. they don't read books they don't, they can't read they can't read text they can't read anything based on 
on visual light. Mm-hmm. Um, but the way they see through through echolocation as well as or, you know basically sonar, mm-hmm. um, as well as uh, you know disturbances, um, and also through uh, I'm pretty sure they they had talked about the electrochemical or uh, tasting yeah tasting tasting and electrochemical. Uh, or I mean electromagnetic, uh, like the, what sharks have on their lateral lines. Oh. Um, I'm th- pretty sure that was talked about at one point when they're really, really close in. Um, but anyway, so the, like not only were – it's not just that they didn't understand each other's language. It's that they didn't understand each other's – even the way each other perceived the universe. Right. They, they were on such completely different mm-hmm. levels, and yet they still managed somehow to come to an understanding. Well, you know what's interesting about that? So they come to the understanding by basically using the NOT system with TAPS. So mm-hmm. think like Morse code, right? Yeah. And what I found interesting is you, in the past, um, uh, I've heard mathematicians make the argument of that is going to be the language we will have to use with aliens first because math is universal. And what we see here is an example of that is what happens. Sort of. But I it's mean, because it's the numbers. Uh, it's okay, three it's, taps means this, yeah, two taps was, mean but this. But that's not math. No, that's, that's the basis of math, it's numbers. A num- okay, it's, it's, it's a number system that still, that still requires someone to... To understand the what is being represented by it, though, I mean, three is a number. Whether you tap it out or you write it out or you flash it out or whatever, that's mm-hmm. that's a number. Right. But the fact that it's then moved, it then becomes a symbol when you attach it to this cup. Right. So no, it's like it's not like math will allow an alien species to recognize that we're intelligent. Mm-hmm. It, we won't be able to transmit the Library of Congress via math because they no. won't have the context. No, and they're, they're, the Elementarians are not going to be able to do that either. But without without that, um, that number basis, they wouldn't have even recognized as intelligent. Right, right. When, and, when... and that was that was actually interesting too because at the very uh, at the beginning of the book or towards the beginning of the book there was. Uh, there was a uh, Richard Branson type adventurer yeah. whose name escapes me right now. It was Henry like Carolac or like something that. like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and he buys the he brings illicitly this like Russian stealth diving suit with him that like mm-hmm. absorbs all sonic or uh, uh, acoustic vibration and so forth. So right. It's, it's, a, it's a it's a stealth suit for the deep ocean. Right. And he figures he's going to be able to go out and swim amongst the Elmatarans and get footage of them mm-hmm. using this thing, which would have worked great. Except when he started swimming amongst the Elmatarans, they noticed a human-shaped hole right. in the sound cloud around them. Right. Like, it was just absorbing everything. So all of a sudden, they were like, what is this friggin' thing that we thing can't hear? That we can't see. It would be like if, some, if, if a black, uh, like an utterly black outline of a human walked into the room right now just a, a complete void not even black but i mean like right. the absence of light right. walked into the room right now we'd all be like what the shit is that we wouldn't and that's exactly what happened with the elmatarans right. and at first I mean, so they captured him and they brought him back and they and he the whole time was thinking hey i get to you know, meet yeah. some people, and and then they cut him open alive because uh, they thought he was a weird fish. Right. So they dissect him because they don't know he's intelligent. They can't. T- they have no idea he's an intelligent creature. Right. But when you have the second, which is technically the second contact with um, Rob and Broadtail. Mm. Um, Broadtail is the lobster guy. That's probably obvious, right? And then Rob <laughs> is a human. Yeah, Broadtail is not a human, as it happens. Um, so. You know, it's because they discover the whole number system that they are eventually able to communicate. But obviously, and, it's and very... teach each other. They end up with their own code. Basically. Right. But it's very difficult because, mm-hmm. of course, yeah. it's it's one thing to Hugely say, like, time three taps and it's a cup. Okay, I understand that. But then grammar. Right. And so it, it, I love it how in the book, it's he doesn't... He doesn't translate the grammar, so to speak. When he shows the humans and and the Elmatarans talking to each other, he actually puts it out where it's like interrogative mm. cup, broad tail, mm. water still, <laughs> you know. And then you know he looks at how the Elmatarans are like discussing among themselves, trying to figure it out. The humans are doing the same, and then how they're communicating. I mean, basically, all they end up out of it having available to them in the early going is is just nouns and some verbs. Right. Like, that's really all they've got. Right. Because the rest of it's how do you how right. do you, how do you communicate that? 
Yeah. Right. And and even by the end of the book, they're they're communicating better and better as you do when you're um, you know, immersed mm. <laughs> in a language um and water and yeah, everything uh, else. Yeah, yeah, um are. but uh they they still are using this like broken Ilmataran mm. tapping as best they can. Um Yeah. So uh do you have any final thoughts we're actually getting pretty close to the end of our episode here um i know so many so many yeah no there's there's just so many thoughts because like i uh i I like this book because it to me it's it just screams super possible Mm -hmm. um because like i was saying earlier in the episode the fact the fact of the matter very very well could be that um not only are are these type of roofed uh you know icy roof water worlds uh, common in the universe, but they they may actually be better s- places for life to develop than than Earth was over the long enough time scales, because of the fact um, if you've got fifty kilometers of ice surrounding your world, ten kilometers, whatever, like it's going to shrug off most big asteroid impacts. I mean, mm. you'd have to have a world-ending friggin' asteroid impact to get through that. Mm-hmm. So most of those impacts just it's not even going to disrupt anything that's going on in the ocean below that. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, the the cores of these worlds stay molten, um, usually not because of internal heat that's generated by radioactive decay or whatnot. It's usually, just like in the case of, of Europa, because of tidal forces of mm. gravitational interactions with the, the, large, uh, the, the large planet that they're orbiting. So that heat never goes away. As long as the planet is orbiting... Mm-hmm which can be for billions and billions and billions of years, that heat remains there, it remains active, the system remains going. They don't have to worry about not having a magnetosphere, um, you know, going dormant and stripping their atmosphere away because their atmosphere doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Like these worlds, in some ways, are, I, are they're so stable for such l- incredibly long periods of time that if life's going to develop elsewhere in the universe, uh, I bet you more often than not it's gonna like look like these lobsters the more often than it does humans lobsters um all right so uh, granted i have many final thoughts about the actual story itself however i i would actually probably like my final thought to be that i really agree with what you said before that um they need to green light the second part we need another book we need a sequel to this this book so was bad fantastic and i don't I don't understand why I had not heard more about it. I don't understand why this is not being passed around among anthropology students. I don't, know why, I don't know why it wasn't up for major awards. Or other social I scientists. It. I want um, to read a book where the humans show back up to Ilmatar with aquarium ships. <laughs> I, and they're bringing Ilmatarans up and showing them around. I, I, and the show and get pissed about it. I want, I, I want all of that. I want it. I don't know. It was just this. I mean, this book was fantastic. Um, you know, or movie. This would make such a beautiful movie. Oh, it would make a, it would make a great movie. It would, yeah, like that, that. That would give me chills. Yeah, yeah I don't know. It would be it was very cinematic. Uh, despite the, despite the really big heady ideas and the, and the, the different layers of, of things that are going on with this, both mm-hmm. from, uh, you know, uh, from the, the societal standpoint and. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the exobiology standpoint it would still make a really compelling film it really would and i actually think it would be doable because if you think about the actual um environments here mm. so a lot of it's happening inside a station mm. so that's just a set or a submarine but yeah or a, a submarine yeah that's sets. a set yep. um you know we have the means to do underwater photography mm. um so that's not a problem the, the cgi wouldn't even be like it, wouldn't it, be that bad yeah, we can do in, that you'd be doing in water in the dark for most of that stuff it wouldn't even be over one god it'd be so easy to do yeah anyway so yeah. this needs to be done but let's uh let's leave it there mm. um if any of our listeners would like to hear more of course they can find you on twitter at, where? at stealthy D, uh sorry stealthy <laughs> geek uh at, at stealthy geek on twitter yeah all right i know I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's been a long day it's, a long it's day. okay and uh as always you can find me at uh at gamer anthro and you can tweet the show at tp at sci-fi science tpn um and let's see where else we are on facebook at sci-fi science and our shows also get linked over to the TPN Network website, which is www.technophilespodcast.com. And I think that's... Oh, and if anybody what? is going to be at Emerald City Comic Con uh, 
in the second or the first or second weekend of April in okay. Seattle. I will be there uh, debuting a new novel. So. Which I can't wait because we will be talking about that in uh, two months from now. Are we really? Yes, cool. we are. Because I made him do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And we will see you again next month. Good night. Good night.